guys, welcome back to Anderton's TV. What a pleasure. Uh, we are flying home from NAM 24 today. Um, and Tim Pierce here, who you know we all know and love uh, from watching his YouTube stuff, listen to his music, uh, doesn't live too far from uh, the airport that we're gonna fly out from. And he very, very graciously said, well, you know, if you're coming through, come and see the studio. So this is where we are. Well, it's man. a thrill for me. It's I've watched a film. Uh, yeah, right. of course. I was gonna say, we'll have to edit that bit out. <laughs> Leave me hanging there. But no, thank you so much for inviting us. <laughs> Fist bump. Yeah. yeah, it's a thrill for me. I am subscribed to your channel, so I watch a lot of you guys' videos. And uh, certainly your output at NAM was uh, Herculean. Uh, is it? We're going to sleep well on the way home. Yeah, good. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, you're going right back to work when you get home, I'm sure. So I Maybe can, not. But, uh, Great job at now. Thanks, man. Well, look, so this is a, a, a Captain Meets video. So we're going to talk about life, the universe and everything. Um, I've seen loads of videos from in here, which is great. But, you know, there's some amazing guitars and pedals and stuff sitting around that you don't normally see on camera. So it's great to be able to see those. But let's, you know, let's let's go back. I mean, you, you, you're you um, born and raised in Albuquerque. Um, moved to LA in the, what, late 70s or 1979. 80s? So my love of music comes from 60s Top 40 radio. Right. It's a great, you know, my timing was good because I was born in 58 and by 1963 I was five years old and the songs on the radio were amazing. The Beatles showed up, yep. you know. By 68 you had Hendrix and Clapton and Billy Gibbons and all these people. And I even saw some of these people. They would tour through Albuquerque. So 1970, uh, you know, I, I just, I started playing in bands and started dreaming of moving to California. And uh, at the age of 21, I was able to move here and get a foothold. It was a huge music industry in 1980 when I moved here. And so it was easy to, to just show up and be another guitar player. And uh, started working, started being able to maintain a few hundred dollars in my bank account and even start buying gear. So basically 1980, I moved here. There were two really forces of music. There was the heavy metal side, which Van Halen represented, and there was the uh, um, new wave side, which uh, the Knack and bands like that, My Sharona represented. Okay. Uh, and so the 80s were a really creative time, but in LA there was the, the really heavy rock side and then the more pop side. And I was involved more in the pop side. I did Rick Springfield records. I toured with Rick Springfield. That got me my foothold. And then... I decided I wanted to plant my feet and become a studio musician. So, what age was was that decision made? Because you, you'd think, you know, guy in his mid twenties probably the, the the upside of touring at that I would have thought was pretty high, wasn't it? It was, but I was more the person that would make. You know, I was I made friends with the ladies on tour, and the other guys did better not making friends, if that makes any sense. So, you know, somebody being somebody you want to talk to, you don't get the opportunities that the guys, you know, who are players get. So. Not guitar players, but anyway, I digress. Anyway, I, I was too nice of a guy to get the opportunities on the road that some of the guys got. <laughs> and I really, I dreamed of being in the laboratory, being in the studio. Okay. So I got a taste of touring and I made some great records in the early 80s. I made uh, Bon Jovi's Runaway just Is by it, chance. So I'm a massive, massive Richie Sambora fan. Bon Jovi, that was oh, my, yeah, you too. know, that, that too. Sort of slippery when wet was one of my yeah, sort of seminal. Yeah. And I was reading your bio, and I was thinking, I was thinking, what what state must have that band been in? You know, just like they was so rock and roll in that, that you end up having to do pretty much all the guitar parts on a on a on a Bon Jovi track. It's just well, like... it was it was a demo. <laughs> I was in New York, and I had done John Waits' record with Neil, Neil Giraldo, which was another great record. I was in New York back to do Carnegie Hall with Rick Springfield. We did like five nights in a row, and. I, tacked on to the end of that, we did some recording sessions for John, and he put together this band. He was living upstairs at the power station. His uncle owned the power station, and we did master demos. One of those was Runaway, and I ended, ended up doing all the guitars on it, and it just, they, I guess they maybe they tried to record it, they couldn't beat it, so it ended up on the first record, fully credited, and it was great. In a sense, it was kind of funny to watch Bon Jovi become the biggest band in the world, and you go, well, I was at the train station. The train was there, but I didn't get on it. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you feel like that? You feel like that in, an, in another parallel universe? Yeah. 
you <clears throat> you were going to be that sort of you know eighties yeah. rock god, massive hair and. But I didn't have that, and that was part of it. And you know, so I was not the right guy. Right. And Richie Sambora is and was the right guy. Great guitar player, great singer. Yeah. We had the image. You know, his band of brothers from New Jersey. It had to be that. Yeah. But there were moments when I go, oh, wait a second, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I have my ticket right here. <laughs> it didn't work out too bad, though, did it? No, yeah, I found out, you know, I had a, a good working man's career in the music business. Now, some of the session guys, successful session guys that I've met from London that were on that sort of 80s scene seem to dominate. It's like the, 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 we, there were so many good songs coming out from at that time. <clears throat> And, and yet actually a relatively small number of musicians playing on like all the songs. Was that the same kind of thing in yes. LA? Yes, so it, it, historically until now, that's what it always was. The Wrecking Crew in the 60s, they did all the records and then they got displaced by bands. And then in the 70s, there were guys like Larry Carlton, uh, players, you know, and then Jeff Percaro, these people. Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, those people continued. New people showed up. Dan Huff showed up in the 90s. My start of busy session work really happened in 1990. And because it was all analog, there were no cell phones. Cell phones started to show up yeah. and there were no computers. Yeah, there were, there were very few computers. <laughs> Pro Tools was like a two-track thing. It was called Sound Tools. Yeah. Everything was analog. So you had to hire people who could get it done in tune. More than that, who would create an idea and be able to repeat that idea and develop it and move on to the next idea to be able to like, oh, that was good. Do that again. Okay, here it is. And then simplify it, refine it. So it was specialists. The people who had the gear, had the motivation, had the skill to yeah. show up and play in tune and get the job done. So, and who were they, were, they, were there guys that, I don't know, you, did, was it competitive? Did you feel like, oh, you know, and are, you, are you sort of almost auditioning sometimes for these things or are, are producers saying, I'm going to get three or four of you into this, but I'm just, I'm going to choose the one. I, I, I'm interested. Of was, course. Was yeah. there always a guy that you like, damn yeah. you, he got this gig and. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you wanted those gigs and they would hire the other guy. They were loyal to the other guy. Then they were loyal to you and everybody was so good. The great thing about being a guitar player is that you would sit next to people. I got to sit next to Steve Lukather. I got to sit next to Dan Huff. I got to sit next to Michael Thompson, who was one of the busiest guys. So you would learn from them one day in the studio with some of these, you know, ringers and you would go, oh, that's how they do it. Right. I need to be more like this, more like that. So it was, it was really a great learning experience. There couldn't be two drummers, but there could be two guitar players. So it was awesome. Very competitive. Who was the other guy, go on, most of the time? Who was the other guy? The guy that got gigs that you wanted? Well, it was Dan Huff. Right. I mean, he took over. He moved here and was so good at what he did. He got recommended the first time and basically became a made man. Right. Because he could deliver every hour. I mean, that's really what it's about. You show up and you yeah. deliver. It's it's kind of like what you guys did at NAMM. No, I, <laughs> that, that, fun enough. I mean, that that's the consistent thread. So yeah. Every successful, um, I've even met. I have one guy that uh, I, I, won't, I won't say who he is, but one guy who played on a ton of British pop records in the nineties, um, and I knew him quite well through the store. And I never even really thought he was that good a guitar player. Like you know, as in I mean, right. Oh, right. But, Maybe that was maybe at my age. I was perhaps he wasn't as flash as I thought he might be. Yeah. But I guess what I've begun to appreciate now he must have just delivered that's the word well it's orchestration just too. deliver These, you know. you're orchestrating guitar parts that are serving a mm. different master they're serving the singer and the mm. song so it to me i would take a simple part make it simpler make mm. it simpler again and that would be the part so you don't end up you know dominating the world with your flash right. and your your yeah. chops it's about orchestration and they, people don't realize how quickly you actually build up all those parts and deliver them on a song move to the next song, do it again. Next song, do it again. Maybe three songs in a day, maybe 10 songs in a day. I mean, I, there, there were sessions like that. You just deliver guitar orchestration and you never you never get tired, you never falter, you never, <laughs> it's, there's, it's, you know, there's no downtime. It's, a, it's probably then, I suppose that session element requires probably that, that just that greatest degree of professionalism then of all the yeah. different to a touring. I mean, obviously, you know, Pete and I have talked a lot you know, touring, there's being on time, being easy to get on with, all that kind of stuff. But I guess, yeah, it, it the output is 
different. You know, there's there's a gig for two hours that night, and that's what it is. But if you're, like you say, if you're in a studio, it's like the difference between getting two songs done in a day and ten songs done in a day is, makes a massive commercial difference, presumably, to the to the production of the of the music. Yeah, you really have to pull yourself up constantly mm. with enthusiasm before dinner, after dinner, before lunch, after lunch, even if the song, like you pour yourself out on a song and go, that was amazing. Okay, next song. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell, I mean, at that time as well, I, I was surprised that you hadn't done more of your own stuff. You know, right. that I, I might mm -hmm. be wrong, but again, according to the internet, there are only two Tim Pierce solo albums. There's only one. There's only one? Yeah. Oh, what are they saying then? Okay, so, so Guitar Land Maybe is the only one, it? Maybe it was on a compilation or something. Right. That was a dream I had because I had played on a Whitney Houston uh, soundtrack, The Bodyguard, and it outsold everything else in existence. And, Massive. And my name didn't end up on it because on soundtracks, there wasn't enough room to put the music, you know. It's like different artists for each song, they would put the producer, the writer, mm -hmm. but the musician. I had no credit on the record, and I thought, okay, I got to do my own record because this is just being this anonymous is not right. So I spent two years of my spare time coming up with stuff and I found a wonderful little label and got a traditional record deal and was able to pay my friends to play, produce. And, and I used songs that I had written with songwriters. So the guitar became the melody yeah. and it was a dream come true. It really was. But ultimately I felt more at home helping and being a session player. Mm. Of course, if the record had done Gangbusters, then I would have gone out and maybe toured on it, and it was an instrumental guitar record. But I got it out of my system, mm. you know, is what I'm trying to say, and I really enjoyed it. But you find what your calling is, mm. and my calling was to be a session guy. It really was. It's an interesting one. I, I, I wonder, is that, your personality is coming across as someone that didn't feel like they needed to be in the limelight. No, I did not. Yeah. And, and again, <clears throat> well, I don't want to jump forward too far because, we're, you know, I always think these things flow better if you can keep a timeline. But what, what's the draw of YouTube for you then if you're not really that bothered about being in the limelight? OK, so I'm sitting here uh, at age 50 and going, OK, the music business has changed. Mm. Uh, I was in a heyday where we were celebrated. It was very prestigious. Now it's getting more like anybody can do this job. No judgment in that. It's great that anybody can show up and play guitar on a record. But the specialist thing started to wane. And even if you're the top guy, I've been doing it for three decades, you're going to age out no matter what. So the budgets are smaller. They don't have as much money as they used to have to pay you to do this thing. That's fine, but so I'm going to make less money. I'm getting older, and they're going to make the choice to have the younger guy eventually. So this is all natural. Mm. And then I met Marty Schwartz, and he and Justin Sanderco had dominated YouTube yeah. with lessons and were selling educational products. I said to myself, if I can do 10% of the business that Marty Schwartz does, I'll be fine. I'm <laughs> off the street for the rest of my life. Yeah. So for a decade, I did sessions full time. And then in my spare time, I built my educational business, built my YouTube channel. And I was a little bit of a, ahead of everybody else. Yeah. And we sold our first educational product. And I went, oh, this works. Right after that, I hired a full time film editor. And I started building my subscription, which is how I run the business. Now I have four yeah. employees and uh, a bunch of members. And the YouTube channel is designed to get people to take a look at the subscription, the online masterclass, it's 150 hours of lessons, almost 2,000 videos. I tried to make it so big that it would, it would really have a lot of yeah. value for people. Yeah. And I keep adding to it. So it's it's become the love of my life. Where is, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in my, I never work out. If I'm 50, am I in my sixth decade on the planet or the fifth decade? It's I think okay. I'm in, I think I'm in the sixth <laughs> decade, aren't I? And I've <clears throat> only recently felt like I want to go back and learn as somebody described it as a, a Scottish guitar player out there called Ross Campbell, who does teaching stuff, he described it as I the... Know, he's been here. Right, great yeah, guitar yeah, player. Great. He describes it as the yeah. intermediate plateau. And I've been on the intermediate plateau for probably the last 20 years. So have I. Uh, <laughs> you definitely haven't. And, and so he's talking about, I really love this. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm dreading it, but I'm also excited about it. Actually doing this, I'm going to go back and unlearn and relearn some of the things that 
I never learned in the first place. So I'm looking for, uh, Justin is a dear friend, so I'm gonna do some stuff with Justin, but I'm looking for other stuff. Where, where would your, how would you describe where, the, the type of guitar player that your tuition is aimed at, your course is aimed at? Okay, so a big part of the masterclass is melodic soloing. Right. Basically, David Gilmour meets Larry Carlton, you know, just some fast playing, but, but be, being able to play, understand how chords work and play the sweet notes over chords, melodic, melodic soloing. I've added a beginner's course that I expand all the time. Mm -hmm. I have late beginner, <laughs> so you can jump from yeah. the beginner to late beginner. I added that later. But it's a, a big part of it was being able to solo over changes and play melodic guitar over pop, rock, R&B, soul, country, the forms of music that are basically simpler. I can describe it another way. If you watch me play and you want to learn to play up to my level, it's perfect for you. But that's with any teacher, really. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I may, that sound, you know, where you pick Larry Carlton and David Gilmore, and, you know, who wouldn't want to be able to play like some sort of concoction of the two of those. So, well, look, I mean, please do, we'll put links uh, to where you can go and find out stuff about Tim's um, education stuff in the description below. But let's get back to um, 90s session playing, 2000. Yeah. Presumably, the biggest change was um, when you just didn't need to turn up to the studio anymore. Yeah, and keyboard players have done that forever. They were always, they always had massive rigs that were both at home and they'd bring those rigs to the studio to do the records. And then guitar players started to do it. And I did that pretty early myself. And for me, the amazing part of this, the most amazing part of it is, might not be what you think. As a session musician, you were constantly losing work because you couldn't be there on the day when they were doing the thing. I lost a 10 day record once because I couldn't do the first day. Right. It's heartbreaking. Ah, uh, you can't be there the first day. We gotta we're, have something. We're called Dan Huff. Exactly. <laughs> and so scheduling, you couldn't be two places at once, or sometimes three places at once. You would li literally lose two gigs on a Thursday because you could only be one place. What the home studio solved was scheduling because you could become like a doctor. In other words, if somebody needed your guitar services, you could say, "I'll see you. I can see you on Thursday morning." Oh. Well, I'm working all week. I can see you on Saturday morning. So it, and because guitar could happen anywhere in the process, people began to realize, well, we can't get guitars on the tracking day, or we'll get some of them, but then we can go to Tim's house and finish guitars on Monday when he's available. So the greatest part of the home studio was you didn't lose work because of scheduling. People would say, yeah, I can come on Tuesday. Yeah, I can come on Saturday. And I would even book sessions on Sunday mornings because everybody was so busy during the week, including me, they couldn't get to it. You didn't lose work anymore. That was the best part of it. Has, does it, is there still a sense that, I've never, you know, I've not been, uh, not experienced the, 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 the sort of, you know, the life that you have and the work you, that you have, but I, I've, I wonder, does it very much change the dynamic of having, a band or you know several musicians in a room in a studio with a, a sort of we need to get this done by the end of day thing rather than everybody remotely has that changed you know is it better worse different i can weigh in on that uh really completely the records that i love the most have been crafted outside of the tracking date okay you choose joshua tree they did not track those guitars live off the floor I understand the satisfaction of mm -hmm. saying, hey, we tracked it all live off the floor. And there are parts that happen live off the floor that are magical. But go through all the records that you think were the greatest records of all time. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the guitars were recorded in the control room, David Gilmore, after they get the basic track. Tell me if I'm wrong. I just think that great records have been built that way mm -hmm through history, so, and it's be, part of it is because when you're going live off the floor, have to get it in, in that moment, you're relying sometimes on stuff that you know is gonna work. You're not taking the same amount of risk. Right. And if you're in the control room in the studio a week later, if you're at home a week later, you're not charging for the studio time, Money is not being burned up. You can give them a free extra hour or three hours. You can give, them, give them a free extra day if you want. You can try and fail. You can try new stuff, not the obvious stuff that you know is going to work in the moment on the tracking date. So 
I have to say that my favorite records, I think the greatest records of all time, have been done more in the laboratory where things are built. They're built on the basic track. You can keep those guitars. You can keep some of those guitars. But when you go in afterwards and start exploring, you can try and fail. You can experiment. Mm -hmm. You can reach for stuff that's maybe not typical. I'm not... I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure that was the answer I was expecting. I, I, I think I live in this idea, this dream that there's like an energy created when everyone's in the room together. And it's You're kind not of wrong. that brings something out. So it's interesting that you You're have a different wrong. perspective on that. Yeah, right? I mean, all the Motown records that we love were done that way. Mm. But uh, all the Wrecking Crew records were done. You know, my favorite record of all time, just made a video about it, is Wichita Lineman by Glenn Campbell. And those were all live records, and you can hear them live. So I'm not negating that. It's just as things moved forward, mm. the records of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s were more built during the tracking date, but also after the tracking date. I want, let's, I'm going to sort of try and move a little bit sort of gear-wise now. <laughs> Great. But, but I think in the context of um, uh, you know, the, idea of the work that you do as a session player, where, how important is it to, to, to just have a vast selection of gear to just inspire you? I mean, what, what's the thought process? If somebody says, here's, here's a track, and I assume you've got some license within that track to put your flavor on it. Um, is it, is it something that you'll go, do you know what? I've tr nothing, it's, I'm not feeling it with this. I'll try this. I'm fit. You know, is it like takes five or six different guitars until you, and, and then something connects with that guitar, or? It's exactly how it always was with me. I would bring, we have cartridge companies who would bring our gear, and I would bring maybe 40 guitars to a session when, when four, they- Four zero. Yeah, when, when I wasn't moving it myself. When I moved the gear <laughs> myself, it's a different story, but I still would bring 12 to 18 guitars when I moved it myself. And the way I would do that, the back seat of whatever car I have, if you put your guitars into soft cases, you can actually, they'll pack like sand. So I would always bring 12, 15, even 18 guitars when I would do my own, move my own gear because they would pack like sand in the back seat of whatever car or truck I own. Then the other gear would go either in the trunk or the back area. The reason you bring all those guitars is it's, there's kind of a magic to it. It's like certain guitars in certain situations, the person sitting next to you, somehow they may not want to see the PRS in your hand. So you have to pick up the Gibson or they might go, you got something that's a little more, you know, retro or, you know, funky and you go, oh yeah, I got the old Gretsch, I'll, I'll, I'll get that. It doesn't tune as well, but that's what they want. So when you're in the heat of battle and then certain guitars, I would cycle through five or six of them just to find the guitar that was right for the particular part or even the person sitting there. You intuit what their, their dreams and prejudices are, and sometimes it takes a few different instruments to find that for them. And maybe you pick up the 335 and use it for the whole thing, because that's the one that they really connect with and the sound that they feel represents them the best. So yeah, it's, it's that being said, one of the great things about today is you can be a guitar player and they, maybe they don't want to see a lot of gear. I have found that happening too, is a certain point, we bring in this massive amount of stuff, pedal boards, amps, speakers, guitars, and they kind of look at you like, I just want the guy who's going to come in with one guitar and throw it on the <laughs> heart, you know. So it has changed for the better in that you can have a, bring a Fender, bring a Gibson, bring a quirky guitar, bring an acoustic. What, what about from a personal level though? Because I think you've sort of said it's about wait until the producers may be happy or the, or the, or the yep. artist is happy themselves. If if you're writing your own material or, or even just searching for inspiration for something to do, is there a, do you have like a go-to or is it always a journey of it going? It changes all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the beauty of it. You know, it's, your ears hear something, you go get a cup of coffee, you come back, they hear something different. It It's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I use a lot of different guitars and there are seasons I have with guitars, with amps, and that season might be a week, it might be a month might be a year, it might be 10 years, stuff you go back to all the time. It's constantly changing. Mm. I think that's, that's the beauty of it. Really. And, and is it always the guitar? Because I, I think I, you know, to a much lower degree, I think I'll perhaps find that I'll 
pedals will change for me and Absolutely. and it's the pedal that kind of just goes oh yeah okay that's a but yeah. is it is it for you is it the tactile Seasoning. guitar yeah is it the tactile nature of the guitar that really at its root is what inspires you to try something different it is and and sometimes buying a new guitar will trigger two months of creative activity wow and you know, it's it's I I don't want to seem like I'm materialistic, but if if you do this for a living and you are professional, the money comes in, you end up spending a lot of it on the gear. And the great thing about a guitar, you buy a guitar, you still have the money. Because well, the guitar you might lose a little money, but you write it off if you're a professional. Yeah. And you get most of the money out of it. So it feels good. I mean, it really does. It also feels good to buy guitars from small builders. And I do that a lot. And you feel like you're helping them put food on the table and you buy this thing that they've bled for with a lifetime of, you know, trial and error. You buy that thing and you still have most of the money you paid for it because it's in the guitar and it still has its value. And you've helped these builders. That, I really love that these days, like, you know, with the small builders. And I mean, your session credits are prolific through the 90s and the noughties and e even more recent than that. It, it, at the moment, what, what sort of, are you scaling it back just to focus more on the education stuff? So what, what's a typical week look like for you now? Right now, the sessions are for family and friends, basically. I still so have a, few, a very small back. group of people that mm -hmm. I'm loyal to that when they call that I will do a session for. Often, I don't charge for that session. Uh, because the business is my focus now, the web business. And so now it's, it's kind of best case scenario because if I do a session, it's, it becomes a celebration for me and the person who's hired me. Right. And money rarely changes hands. Wow. So it's really fun now. What about the, I, I know um, you've got a Grammys performance yeah. coming up. So, I mean, do you, do you play live? even just for fun or occasionally yeah i sat in with a friend at the baked potato this year wow and uh, his band and it was really fun andrew sinewick he's like the busiest studio guitar player in la right now you'll interview him eventually uh and the grammy thing i tried to talk my way out of i actually gave it to andrew for the last two years because it takes so much preparation that i didn't have time to do the prep this year the musical director specifically said hey I want you to do it this year and I said he said what do you need and I said you give me 40 songs a month in advance another 20 three weeks in advance then the other 20 a week in advance and I can do it because what would happen we would do NAM. it always works this way and get really busy and have all these songs to learn before the Grammy Awards and because I'm the only non-reader in the group I have to learn stuff in advance not only did he give me 40 songs uh, a month in advance he got me about 55 of them a month in advance so i'm i'm pretty well learned already and we still have a week to go so you, you guys i'm talking to justin derrico we mentioned i think that was before we started filming we were talking about him and his uh, shabbat guitars but I met him last year and again i don't know how you do this because he, he's doing the voice yeah that is the, and, and even i would fold in, on the voice i, I would bet, fold i bet you wouldn't but i'll tell very, you a story but you, you, you go first well, and i'll I tell know, you a story I, just say, I yeah. think i think justin was saying you know it's like you, you are you are learning i forget now 70 80 songs per show two minute versions of them because what because and the reason it's that many is because each artist has probably got six or seven songs that they haven't decided which one they're going to do that yes. night until yes. the day of the thing. So yeah. you've got ten contestants, seven songs per contestant, whatever, to then find out on the day that these are the one of each we're going to do. Yeah. And I was just thinking, how do you? But again, who, who the we met Dory? Um, yeah, Dory. I saw the video. Yeah, yeah uh, who I I've Dory. not met before, but he's obviously doing the voice as well. Yeah. And I don't know what, I can't remember what we filmed with him on, how much was off camera, but he was just going, let me pr play you this Britpop medley that, you know, and just off the bat, yeah. he just takes 10 Britpop songs, works them into a medley that are all recognizable like that, and just plays this thing and you're just going like, oh my God, this is another level, you know, it's just. Yeah, it takes a certain kind of person. Uh, some musicians do have photographic memories. Mm. I had never have had that. I'll learn the Rain song by Led Zeppelin, which is their b most beautiful acoustic thing. Yeah. I've learned that song three times, and I couldn't play it for you now. It just, you know, the 
certain people we know have photographic memories, so that helps. I've never really had that, but the voice is the epitome of that. They're on the floor, long days, learning constantly and trying new stuff. I would get hired on the voice every December so that the guys could sleep. <laughs> Because that's when they would make the actual records, the iTunes records for the voice artists. And they were working so hard that there were, I would go in and do overflow sessions for Bill Appleberry, who was producing all this stuff. And he would play me some of Justin's stuff, and I would just do a few songs so the guys could sleep. Ah. Uh, that's it. <laughs> it's, this, I think, it's... I do, and I hope this isn't sort of off-putting for aspiring session players, but it really is a small pool. Yeah, it is. You know, and I, and I don't it know is. how you, you know, especially the last 20 years or so when you've had this massive um, growth in music colleges. I don't know, you know, I know in the States you've got a couple of famous ones, but, you know, in, in the UK we, <clears throat> we've probably had enough new music colleges in the last 20 years to be producing two or three thousand new guitar mm -hmm. graduates a year and you're going if there's only 10 people in the pool <laughs> it's like it's pretty cutthroat it was always hard to get into yeah. and it was you know if your skill level gets into the 97th percentile you get no work because the guys in the 98th percentile get all the work I mean, it's one of those kinds of careers. But what I say to young musicians is this, is, I mean, those of us who did sessions every day, it was a little too much. It's, I, you can be a little fresher if you don't do it all the time. So that's a, a benefit. It, and the thing you need to do is find people who be loyal to you. I would invest in composers um, who, an artist who I thought were going to maybe do better. Like I would do really low paying sessions for people that, I thought would have better work in the future. Well, this guy's gonna be a film composer, I can tell. So you can build loyal relationships early on mm. uh, for people who might not have the money to pay you. That's one way to do it. But also, do everything. Play live, make an educational product, uh, do music for television and film, do jingles, do everything you possibly can as a musician in the other mm. you know, lanes and make session work part of it because I think that's what you have to do. You have to... You have to do everything these days. And in a way, that's almost better, I think, you know, to do a little bit of everything. It's as if I could do this all day, but I'm sort of conscious of the fact that we've got a plane to catch and you've probably got better things to do. Would you mind if we sort of get up and just doing a little bit of a... Oh, please. And, and if there's a story going, oh, this was on this record or please, this was this, yeah. you know, it would be great. Absolutely. So we're, we've got a rack of guitars around the room, so yeah, let's... <laughs> this is a James Tyler guitar that I got, I think, in the 90s. Would that right. be right? Yeah. Yeah, and I love it. Super wide neck, has the mid boost, which means when you play a solo, you press this button and you can make the, the high notes on the solo really fat. You know, it's basically great for Landau Huff style playing and... The 80s never goes away now. It's kind of like back forever at this point. You can point. see that fretboard has seen some action. Oh, yeah. So this is obviously must have been. This oh, has yeah. been on a, a, few, a few tunes there, Absolutely. Obviously. And I might even use it on the Grammys in a week. This guitar... That, that, you know when you're saying about... I mean, isn't that a great example? Because that wouldn't have been a cheap guitar, you no. know. But, you know, you've had that now, we've maybe talking 25 plus years. Yeah. Uh, it's made you money yeah. using it. And you could sell it tomorrow for probably what you paid for it. I mean, how many other tradespeople can say that's yeah, the truth? The, the, tool, the tools of my trade, you know, yeah. don't ever really cost me anything. And this one, I could sell it for more than I paid. For sure. Not all of them are like that. In fact, few are. But this is a Bill Nash. Bill Nash is a really good person. And this this guitar is super loud. Has Lawlers. It's great for Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of stuff. And I played this for years too. It's, it's been on a lot of records and a lot of videos. Let's move on. What have we got down here? This is a reissue of a 1960 Les Paul. The neck shape on this was perfect for me. I had it refretted with jumbo frets. This has my signature pickups in it, which... Uh, who, who do you make those Arcane, with? yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, Robert Arcane makes yeah, yeah. these. And we developed the pickups with this guitar, so I am really, really, uh, really like it. Okay, we move on. I've always been in love with Tom Anderson. Do you know, there's a there's one of the guitars that you've just. Oh. <laughs> let's, let's, let's hope that wasn't a. Please put that in the video. 
<laughs> they're not precious. They're not precious. I'm no. I was gonna, one of the guitars we we skipped there. Yeah. And I, I'm always intrigued. Cause Pete's the Pete's the same. I, I always feel like I'm, I'm, I don't want this to be unfair, but this, this, there's. Session players often need to have something that's a bit quirky, not necessarily oh, the greatest so guitar right. ever. I mean, you, Pete has a Dan Electro that he pulls yeah. out every so often. I was like, really? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but sometimes you need. Yeah. So it's what? Awful. Yeah. No, it's really know, true. It, I'm not but, suggesting that yeah, this guitar is awful, but no, it sort no, of it struck is, me as like. <laughs> but it does that thing. You know, yeah. So what? Is. Well, the, the story behind this one is Mark Letary got me this guitar because he was playing one and raving about it because it's got the short scale. So it's a baritone, but you don't have to stretch as much to right. play it. So it sounds amazing, but you're, to your point, I got asked to do a Jewel record once. You remember her? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Um, and the producer said she only wants the cheap sounding guitar. So I went out and bought four of the early, like, you know, the Supro Dan Electro yeah. guitars from, yeah. you know, the early days. And there is something to that. They, they have a character that, polished fancy guitars don't have and the new harmonies do that for me now That's the a new harmonies shout. Yeah. If, uh, and then it's kind of like a secret weapon because it plays in tune mm. <laughs> and, and I, do you know what funny enough that's that's again we're talking about uh, the shabbat thing yeah and that um duo sonic that he had on the stand which is and this was crazy and this is you'll have to go and see the the the, the, the video for that this was a really expensive probably four thousand dollar copy of a guitar that you could just go and buy for probably five hundred dollars in even get an original 60s one but it was sort of it's got the cheap sounding vibe but on a guitar that's just immaculate to play so it's a, a weird you know I, I i must admit i'm I, I think i'm talking myself into phoning abby and buying i want it too if you're yeah. gonna get it i want to get it too <laughs> but put my order in I, i'll wait for it i'm fine to wait for it you're absolutely right about that what i've done in the past is I'll take a guitar that's kind of a newer version of the cheap character mm. guitar, and if it plays in tune, I'll sneak it in. I won't exactly say that this is basically a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I do the same thing. So come on, we were going to talk about this, the Anderson. Uh, I've, Tom Anderson, I played his his guitars a mm. lot in the '90s, and this is an amazing guitar that I don't know if he makes anymore. I don't think I've ever seen this shape. Called the from Adam, from, yeah, from, before. And, I'm keeping it because it sounds amazing. And looks, cool. It kind of disappears when you play it. It's nice. I love the color. This guitar I bought at Norm's. Uh, hmm. I think it's like a 2012. It sounds incredible. And I think this era was known to, to sound really good and play really good. Um, I don't know. I just what, again, I love so it. Very, it makes very, me play different. Yeah. It it's, makes it, me play you know, different. Firebird is probably one of those... Uh, one of those, the most unusual Gibson guitars yeah. they've ever made. It doesn't naturally, for me, <clears throat> it's a statement guitar. It's like, I'm in a rock band, I'm gonna stand at the yeah. front and people are gonna go, who's yeah. the dude with the cool? But as a session guy, so what, what, I get, what, what's the song? You know, well, where, where's this, where's this? I don't, I don't mean specifically, but what do, you, what do you think? Like if you had a job came in today, what kind of job would it be for you to go, hmm, maybe the Firebird? Uh, I think like a 60s kind of, rock song you know it really it really excels at that it's like a winter throaty stuff. yeah <laughs> yeah it sounds throaty yeah yeah it's and the wide neck and this big slab and these pickups it it, it sounds incredible <laughs> okay i've got to talk about this it's not actually a mandolin is it but it's sort of oh. a, what is it like a sort of a and <clears throat> these have been around for years in different forms this is a new one a company in canada they still call it a hammer tone uh but it's really an incredible sound. I mean, it's do, just... Do you think that the, re the reason I ask about this, do you think that your mandolin playing on Iris is, is, is like, if, is that the, your most iconic piece that that's you've ever played yeah, that's, on a record? Yeah, that's probably the, the best song I ever played on. And, you know, the, the, the song that everybody wants to hear still to this day. It, because it's, it's not like a rhythm guitar part that's in no, the back. It's like... No that if you take the mandolin thing out of that song and it's not that song anymore well yeah it, it's part of it and the slide solo the electric solo is me too right. so i i that was a funny story i didn't want to walk into the, the session with just a mandolin case and be the guy so i brought my gear and they got irritated i found out later they were mad at me for i brought a truckload of gear and the producer said well let's let him try an electric guitar part and i played a solo and they liked it but i they were annoyed that i brought my big electric rig oh. but i wanted to try and force the issue 
I just, I, I'm, you know? and, and, okay, so that solo, yeah. again, which is so iconic in that song, are you just told, right, here's the bit where the solo goes, Tim, play something? In that it, situation, everything I did on that song, I made up, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, as I said, that's... Yeah, all improvised. <laughs> if, I, I'd be amazed if anybody, whether yeah. you're 10 years old watching this video or 99 years old watching this video, I'd be amazed if anybody can't literally hear that solo and hear the mandolin intro, hear the solo in their head now. And there's not many... You know, there's not many songs where it's just so instantly... I think, yeah, that's why I, I, I saw that guitar. I know, yeah. I know it's not yeah. a mandolin, but I, it but triggered no, you, my memory thanks to go. Thanks for bringing up the story. It's... Um, it's uh, did you know of, when you when when like? Do you know as you walk out of a, a a session like that, going like, I killed it, or are you still waiting to see like? You who never knows? know, right? You never know because there's so much objectivity after you leave. When you're there doing it in the moment, everybody is so excited, mm. but then the objectivity sets in and they live with it. Yeah, and then it might you know the song might get built up another way. Yeah. So no, were, you never know. I'm just trying to think. They weren't massive were they that was their breakthrough that was a breakthrough they were like a sort of sort of established rock yeah. punk rock band yeah. and that was yeah. a song for a movie on a soundtrack that just for 18 months it was like the most played song everywhere nice so that paid the rent for a few months then i'm guessing yep <laughs> it did yeah and this is a 58 gretsch that looks brand new this is i think i got this for that jewel record uh but it, it's not a cheap guitar, but it was it was something I needed and didn't have. And it's a little bit hard to play. It doesn't tune that well, but boy, it sounds... It makes you play different. Guitars, mm. when you're a polished player, any guitar that takes away your polish is actually an asset. And that's what we're talking about. Any guitar that makes you less polished, that you have to fight a little bit, makes you a different player, and it's really valuable. This is essential. Fernanda Sustainer... Ah. Uh, I do ambient parts with a volume pedal and endless delay. I can create keyboard sounds that just float above the track and they can fly around. Having a Fernandez sustainer guitar is essential. It really is. So find one, get one. It's really, in, I mean, if you can. Th this, I think this is where you know you're in a proper player's house here because every guitar you've shown me so far, the wear on the fretboard. And, and it's like none of yeah. these guitars are for show. These are yeah. all being used. Well, some of the ones have come new because of just doing YouTube videos and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But here's an example. This is the Anderson that I played on tons of records. And when I got it, I was very, very tired of all the fancy finishes. And I said, just give it to me unfinished. And yeah, it needs to be cleaned, but... <laughs> but it looks uh, great. Yeah. I'm glad great. I kept Again, this, this Is this all the stock pickups it came with? Or well, this done... assembly has been traded out probably five times. Right. You know, I've had this guitar for 30 years. So, yeah, this, is, this has been changed out many, many times. But the guitar has stayed the same. Please tell me about the Blue Gretsch, just because so, it looks so cool. This showed up at Norm's, and right. Norm's is five minutes away from here, okay? So, which is dangerous. Mm. Uh, this showed up at Norm's. I think I saw it in an Instagram photo, and in Instagram it looked even bluer, and I thought, wow, that looks amazing. I went down, I picked it up, and it feels like a 59 Les Paul. I have never in my life played a Gretsch. This has got a, basically a Les Paul neck on it. And, okay, I, I always try and make a sober decision. When I'm in a music <laughs> store, and I see the thing I want, I go, okay, you're drunk right now, with desire. <laughs> <laughs> walk out of the store and sober up and in this case I and I always try and actually walk away and spend the night away and I always try and wait a day but sometimes at norms when something comes in it goes just like that yeah luckily I went back the next day sober and it was still there he had waited like a year for this guitar and it showed up and I'm very lucky it didn't sell immediately I brought two guitars to trade, I brought cash, so Steven Stern Master Build, I, I'm gonna keep this guitar for the rest of my life. It's, it's amazing, it sounds amazing. Yeah, I saw you really like them too. Don't say, you? We've yeah. had two or three Steven Stern Master Builds through the store over the last five years or so, and I get every time I have to say, no, these are, we're a, yeah. bus <laughs> we're a business here, we need to buy these yeah. to sell. If I keep yeah. these, I can't, yeah. you know, yeah. pay the bills. So, but they're, there's, they're just 
And I, actually, I, I have to say, I think that's the best one I've ever seen. Well, that like, coming the from cool, you, the coolest thank you. one I've ever seen. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, I, I we've done I, a part I've got, just before. <laughs> look, we've been waiting four years, I think. Now we have a we have a Stephen Stern purple penguin that we've basically that was like a custom, and I, you know, it's like I just can't wait to, you know, I mean, I get, we're all going to have to go. Not, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. But there's, I mean, they're crazy expensive, aren't they? But yeah, just... and uh, the trade was not uh, favorable for me. Uh, when I look back on it, I went, I, yeah, I really kind of blew it there. <laughs> oh, man. But that's okay. It's nice to have. It's a great yeah. looking thing. It's really nice. I am friends with Joe Bonamassa. Um, and I, I found this at Nor Norm's also. It's his um, you know, signature that they did a few of these. Mm -hmm. You'll remember when. And it's a great uh, 335. And I see you've got a couple of 335s. Yeah, this, the, they both came from Norm. Right. This is the most expensive guitar I've ever bought. Uh, you got... And it's, it was $9,500, I'll go ahead and say it. And the reason it was only $9,500 is a 62 335, but it does not have the original pickups. It had a refret. Uh, there may be some other things that are not original, but uh, it's, I love it. And is that, people often say the 335 is, is, you know, the most versatile guitar, it's, it's a, I guess Larry Carlton has yeah, sort of made yeah. it. Sort of, but do you find, is there a, actually I would say maybe some of your Andersons feel more like, but is, what, what's their type of guitar that you think that that's the one, if I, you know, like my Desert Island guitar? I don't know that I have one. Um, maybe the, not Desert Island, but if, if I said to you, okay, um, over the next 12 months, you're going to get 50 sessions. And for whatever reason, there's, you, there is only one guitar that you're going to be able to. And it's like, I, I you take away all the fact that it'll be, it'll, you, you, it'll, it'll be a pain in the ass because okay. you won't have okay. the inspiration and, you know, and okay. I, all the reasons yeah. as to why you need more. But I don't, I'm just, I'm intrigued as to okay. like, what for, would it be? For me, it's a Les Paul. Okay. Right. So I have had Les Pauls made by different Mm -hmm. makers. This is my Les Paul that Paul made me. <laughs> and this was custom made. It was expensive because I, I, I custom ordered it. I had dots put in rather than birds. Yeah. For me, it's the Les Paul. Absolutely. The guitar that I need primarily to make my sound, mm -hmm. whether it's for me or for you or an artist, is a Les Paul. Now, that could be a Gibson Les Paul, but for me, it's hard to find the right Gibson Les Paul. You know, I have a couple that come mm -hmm. close. So with Paul and this guitar and with Heritage, I am chasing my ultimate Les Paul. Well, I Paul. guess Heritage is probably the, the, the closest. Yeah. You know, if it's just a straight out, and you know, if, it, if it's a, a Les Paul, but not a Gibson, yeah. it's, it's, it's probably and, as and close I've as had you lots of Gibson Les Pauls. Mm. I have three right now that are all very good. But this by Heritage, we designed this guitar it's chambered, but it sounds amazing, even though it's chambered. It has the neck that I like, which is the 60s slim taper mm -hmm. neck. It has the exact frets I like. The pickups sound great. Getting closer, so yeah, it's it's a boutique Les Paul. Mm -hmm. That's the guitar that is I Is this need. the Arcane set as well? No, you? it's not. It's oh, theirs, okay. yeah. I'm totally open. This was a project I did with Rob. Mm -hmm. I met Rob through Joe Bonamassa. We were hanging out together, and Rob said, let's do this. And I said, yeah, I'll tell you what I like, because I like these pickups that I have that were made by Tom Holmes. And he told me, oh, I used to work with Tom Holmes and I made a bunch of pickups for him. So he knew exactly what to do. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're really bell-like and open sounding. I'm so quite, yeah. I am quite surprised that you've picked Les Paul. Yeah. As in, in you know, that it, it's, it's you a guitar. You pushed me into it no, and I, it's it, the it, truth. It, it, it's it's, it's a truth. guitar. I mean, that funnily enough, I think I'm pretty sure that was my you know, I've got a, a fifth, an R8, which I've put some different pickups in. And I'm exactly the same as you. I hate the Desert Island question. Yeah. Because the, right. it would torture me yeah. to only have one right. guitar right. to play. Yeah. But it is push come to shove. It would be like, probably yeah. that one then. Yeah. You know? I mean, when I play live, I mean, the Heritage is a new thing. We worked on this for a year and a half. The mm. first one they sent me. I rejected because it wasn't quite right and it was kind of heartbreaking because it has one of the most beautiful tops I've ever seen. We gave it to John Thompson at okay. Bad Cat. Yeah. He has it now. Uh, this, this single cut PRS mm. does it for me. 
The they delivered guitar. these to me without any build sheets. I've got to get sheets for did them. Did you ask? Because I don't think I've ever seen Paul do the abalone thing inside no, no, the reveal binding. Purfling. It looks great. And I love it. Mm. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I just, a little you, bit you of know, there's, there's, it's so, I think you can tell a lot about the character of a person from the guitars that they draw to. Yeah. And it's like somebody that just has a black guitar isn't, is again, it's someone just going, I'm confident in my own ability like that, but I don't yeah. need to shout about it. Yeah. It's not, I, I, I've played this more live than any other guitar. Also, wow. having a one piece bridge, mm -hmm. my favorite thing. So, yes, any version of a Les Paul, but these days it's usually kind of a boutique version made by somebody and not made by Gibson. Where's the, uh, where's the jazz master that's on the front of Guitarland? That was a rented guitar oh. for the photo shoot. <laughs> So it's not, he never even got played no, no. on the album. But I do have this, which uh, I've used a lot. And this qualifies as that funky guitar you were talking about. Yeah. And it's a, a real 62, nice. short scale. Yeah. Are they, are they round, round ones? It must just be. Yeah, they're, how did you, how did you oh, know? You saw that these are flat ones. Oh, no, it is a flat one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is flat one. Yeah. Flat wounds on a, on a Jaguar. Yeah, it's great. I mean, everybody should have funky. flat wounds on one or two of their guitars. Yeah. Definitely, it's a different sound. So, there are other guitars. I have, you know, lots of PRSs, lots of uh, different strats. I I buy more guitars these days because they end up in videos. Um, right. But yeah. It's kind of the. And what about? I mean, pedals wise, is it, is it okay to shoot in the hall here and just look at? Oh, the totally. Big, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this is the, this is the kind of the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this is what everybody, every guitar player aspires to. Uh, you know, which drive pedal shall I use today? Well, um, well, for me, it the drive pedal that changed my life was Tom Bukovac sent a ODR one to John Shanks mm -hmm. a number of years ago, and so John got a couple more, and John gave me one of these, the ODR one from the early nineties. And I connected with it and have used that constantly ever since. I ended up sourcing some new old stock ones of my, uh, of my own years ago. I forgot you did this. Yeah, it's, yeah the, the it rocket, sounds good. Uh, I just put guys. one on my pedal board. It's quite a good pedal. It really sounds good. You know, good. I, again, you would, I would think that you should have more signature gear. You must get brands asking you every day, don't they, to do signature well, stuff? Well, the truth about that is I like to be independent. Okay. And there's an obligation when you do that. And, you know, I like to use everything. And the business I have is selling education. And it's just a much bigger, mm. uh, you know, a bigger thing to sell rather than a, a pedal. So. Where, you've got, where you've got multiples. I don't think I've ever even heard of this pedal. Yeah, that I'm, was a U2 thing. John up. Shanks uh, espoused that. John Shanks is a guitar player and who became a big producer. Who yeah. He has his own pedals and stuff. But... That, that's it, something the Edge used early on. Oh, wow. Yeah. Was he a big inspiration for you, the Edge, back then? I think so, yeah. yeah. Not the most popular guitar player in the world, but for the record-making people, he really gave us a lot of colors to, mm. to, you know, to inspire us, uh, you know. We played... Uh, the Vermeram stuff uh, is amazing. They've got two, they had two new pedals at the show yeah, as well. Yeah, I like, saw that. Oh, man. Oh man, look at this. This is actually this is this is almost like home from home now. This is what it's like at Anderson's every day. So it's seeing like, you know, what pedals shall we use yeah, today? Yeah. But you've got some cool stuff here. But you're saying it's a bit of a graveyard, so you're not once you've got a board, are you kind of do you, well, does it these change? yeah, these are not being used right now, but they're always ready. Like, mm. you know, what there's no better univibe, you know, you, there's no better organ sound, you know, there's Chris will be so pleased if you yeah. just said there's no better Univibe than yeah. the pedal pull yeah. one. I don't think so. I really like Chris will cut this out and relentlessly repost that <laughs> comment on uh, Instagram now. <laughs> I like him. I respect him. But the, so this is the board I built for the Grammys, but yeah. it'll be used beyond that. So I'm going to just roll through this really yeah, quickly. Yeah, do. Uh, I mean, so, okay, so Grammys is you've got 80 songs and presumably... That's the ultimate challenge for a pedal board, because what are you going, everything from potentially Metallica through to right. some sort of 50s skiffle exactly, kind of thing? Exactly, exactly. Um, so, so how do you put a board together for that? Well, if this has eight loops on it, and you can program presets. This is the Dingbat. And so this is a clone of the ODR-1. This is okay. a clone of the Mostortion. They're both dead-on clones. 
Okay. No, I, I have a compressor I've on. Cal yeah. Calma pedals. You will. Uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're getting out there. They're doing well. Um, I just did this for a lark. You know, it's, just, ah, I use, it it's got a good high gain sound and a good there mid gain sound too. This I'll use for really heavy delays. It's, it sounds beautiful. I like dark modulated, uh, you know, dotted eighth quarter delays. Mm -hmm. This is a great Leslie and it has to be right there so you can change yeah. the speed. For me, the whole thing about a Leslie is changing the speed constantly. That's the emotional part of it, yeah. slow to fast. And then it's a great delay, the yeah. LBX. A great reverb that's convenient to use. Yeah. And then these kind of, these are like uh, jack of all trades, you know, the new line sixes. I can get one every, cool, you yeah. know, if I need a phaser, it's there. If I need a ring modulator, it's there. If I need vibrato, it's there. So a really, really practical pedal board. The and great you, thing it, about the, this. Sorry, the switcher along the front, is that, are you... Is that sort of MIDI programmable switching, or are you just? Is it much simpler than that? Just it's going? much simpler than that. It uh, you you could use MIDI, but I don't really bother with that. What it does is it allows you to program different scenes, so you can have different combinations of pedals. You go from verse with clean chorus and compression to to chorus with heavy distortion just with the press of a button. So it's like you know, it's just you can program scenes. But the great thing about this, I have the reverb and delay on expression pedals. So I can go from dry. Okay, let me just get this right. I'm really wild about being able to press on, I have a, an expression pedal for the delay and the reverb. I can do them both at the same time. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, I don't, I've, I've seen it done by accident before, but I'm not sure I've ever seen it intentionally done that. It's very clever. So if I'm in, doing a solo, I can dry it up, or just as an event, make it wet. Really fun, so that's what I love so about this. So, and, and you're set on this now. This will be your Grammy, your yeah. Grammy board, will yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, and then so beyond cool. too, it'll, for, it's it's ready to go for mm. sessions too, because if I do a session now, I'm just carrying the gear in my car. It's no big deal for yeah. me, you know. It's just I throw this in the car. It's always I think it's quite nice as well for for you know the the the, the viewers to see this because you know it, it does not every board has to have the most expensive reverb, the most expensive mm -hmm. delay, the most ex you know you've yeah. got some the. Yeah, the Boss compressor and the tremolo. The tremolo is just a basic TR2. It's just... Yeah, Boss. When I first met Tom Bukovac, we did a record, a, a Rob Thomas record together, and I thought, you know, we were together, and I thought, I thought, this is the greatest studio guitar player I've ever worked with. That's another story, though. And you know, he was he, he was like, man, I love Boss pedals. I love Boss pedals. He would say, you that's, know, that's, it's like <laughs> that, that, to, to, Tom is is uh, Pete's been getting into Tom. I think it's. I mean, obviously great great player but yeah. it's it's his um view it's just his worldly view on you know music and guitar playing and stuff he's so forthright in just saying you know that's what i'm going to say yeah it's just it's, honesty yeah, yeah. just yeah. Um, honesty with his iphone yeah but i it, yeah it, it, he's a great uh, and still i think refuses to be on instagram <laughs> you can just it's like yeah he's just like yeah this is not his thing is it yeah. it's just anyway yeah. great player so this will be at the grammys I mean, can we do another little... Like, yeah, you need to do that because that, that's where, you, you know, yeah, I, I really see, have a lot of stuff. Obviously, everything that you guys have been watching now is not normally where you see Tim. Yeah. Let me just I'm not going to be the first person there. to say this, but do you feel like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Captain Kirk? Now, who was, the, was it, who was the... Who was the main driver of the USS Enterprise? Yeah, was it's it him. Zulu yeah. or and whatever? And I do, like and it is, like... it is designed to be a spaceship and a cockpit, and I'm just going to really, really quickly run it down for you. Let me plug in, and I get a chance to use this really fancy PRS. The oh, there you can see, you can, oh, yeah, you can see yourself. Yeah. So this is the film studio now, and then... <laughs> it's also a studio for... I, when I have clients here now, I turn that around. Great name for a booster. Okay, so you talked the about... A, yeah, so George Tripps at Way Huge is... Yeah. We are making a signature drive pedal. Okay. So, yeah, you, it, it, it's happening. 
Okay, so I'm playing through real amps and real cabinets. The cabinets, I have six 412s in my vault downstairs. Four of them are active right now. Each cabinet has two mics on it. The two mics go into these mic pre's. So when I, I, I'll show you just as an example, if I want to play through, right now I'm playing through 1968 1217 Celestians. I'm using a, let's see, which, I'm using a 57 and a Royer combined. Now I'm going to go to another set of speakers. This is another cabinet. There's a 57 and a Sony C800 in front of it. I just have to switch over here. These are more hi-fi. They're 65 mm -hmm. watt speakers, so they're good for some part. And then I can switch all the heads and go from one head to the other with this Cahayan amp switch over, switcher over here. So I've got like nine heads or ten heads hooked up and four cabinets right now. And then these pedal shelves are activated with these buttons right here. Hit this button. And to get control of it. This Echo Park is the greatest infinite delay machine ever invented. It's just so musical the way the delays decay. So just, you know, try it out if you want. These are great. That's great. I, I love analog delays. I experiment with them. Then the second shelf down here has all this stuff. One squeeze on in. H H90. And then the third shelf is this Ebo Reverb, which Bukovac recommended I get. I love it. And then lastly, if your amp has an effects loop, the H9s sound great. So I have my H9s through the effects loop of this Bad Cat Hot Cat. So a lot of cool stuff just, you know, within reach. Distortion pedals here, drive pedals, volume pedal, time-based pedals, amps, speakers, microphones. I, I'm guessing you've been asked this many times before, and you are without doubt a man after my own heart with the kind of rig that you've put together. But wouldn't it just be massively easier to just have a quad cortex or a helix or a Kemper? <laughs> Well, I love those boxes. I'll switch quickly to this FM9 for yeah. some sounds because the way I look at it, they're still artificial sounds, but I love them. And I love the nature of an artificial sound. I have a dream box sitting right there that I used for guests that came last mm -hmm. week. Those boxes, they put the sound right in your face. They're getting better all the time. I still hear the difference. So... Yes, it would be easier, and I did a big video on the quad, on the, the Tonex quad. Yeah. I did a big video on the Tonex, which I love. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I've used the Kemper a lot. I've used, I used to have an Axe FX3 up there. Now I have the FM9. I love these devices. Yeah. I welcome them. But I can hear the difference, particularly in the top end, between the real amp, the real cabinet, going through the real converters, the real microphones and the actual, you know, yeah. these artificial devices. I love them though. Yeah, I, it, I love them. I mean, I, I think it was, it was it, well, I wasn't asking the question to try to convince you to change oh, no. anything. Cause no. I, I think again, yeah. whether it's, I'm, I'm not, sometimes I wonder how much of the difference I can actually hear. I, I just, it's the tactile nature that I still, yeah. you know, I still like yeah. pedals and amps yeah. to just, yeah. you know, um, but it's, I mean, this is incredible. It's, how many years has it taken you to sort of put this little um, control, you know? Well, it changes all the time and it gets upgraded all the time. But I started this 20 years ago, basically. Mm. This cockpit started about 20 years ago. And a lot of the components have been changed out over time. You just make little improvements all the yeah. time, you know? Um, I mean, I think we're sort of drawing to a, yeah. to a close here. You so, um, I mean, it's been 
just such a pleasure uh, uh, to, to come too. and see you and wonderful to get to, to hear a, a bit more about your life. And, um, but yeah, what can I say? Thank you so much for your hospitality, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Tim I'll Pierce. come see you in England. Oh, please do. That would be a joy. All right. Well, look, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Take it easy. Yeah, you too.